the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the whistler. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Decision. Months later, when he finally got a chance to think about it clearly, he decided that if it hadn't happened so suddenly, it might not have happened at all. It was April, of course. That might have had something to do with it. The rhododendrons were blooming in Golden Gate Park, the kids playing ball on the green lawns, and spring sifting in the open window of his office on the 20th floor of the Hamilton Building. As Dr. Paul Evans sat looking at an uninspiring assortment of x-rays of Mrs. Harrison's chest cavity. Excuse me, Dr. Evans. Oh, what is it, nurse? There's a phone call from Mrs. John Cameron. Can you see her today? Is it important? She says so. Well, they all do. When am I free? Well, there's 12.30. All right, I'll see her then. But what about lunch? I'll have to skip it. Mrs. Cameron's heart is undoubtedly more important than my lunch. Yes, it could have been the way that it happened. It's startling suddenness, throwing you off balance. Or maybe it was just spring in San Francisco. But most of all, it was a black-haired girl with blue eyes, standing by the window when you looked up from your x-rays a half hour later. You remember exactly how she looked. The jersey dress with a gold belt and clip. The smart little felt hat, accenting her dark hair making you realize in a split second what was wrong with all the girls you ever knew. She must have come in while you sat at the film illuminator, looking at negative, Evidence, making notes. minor valvular lesions, plus slight enlargement. You're Dr. Evans. All uh, right, I'll be with you in just a moment. Request detailed cardiograph immediately. There we are. Please sit down. I'll get rid of this stuff. Now, you must... Hello. How do you do? I'm Carol Cameron. Yes, I... The nurse said you were rather concerned about yourself. Oh, it's not about myself. It's it's about my my husband. I see. John Cameron. Perhaps you've heard of him? Stocks and bonds, isn't it? Yes. Few too many, I'm afraid. Oh? Well, he's been under a terrible strain recently. The night before last, he had a rather severe attack. His heart? Yes. Dr. Miles, our family physician, suggested I see you about it. Uh, where is your husband now? Oh, at at home. In bed. Didn't Dr. Miles recommend the hospital? Oh, John's awfully unreasonable. He wouldn't hear of it. Insisted he'd be up and around in a day or two. That is unreasonable. You'll see him, Dr. Evans. Of course. I'll be glad to do what I can. The 
Just like that, Paul. A minute or so, and she's gone. You look up, you see her. And 30 seconds later, she could ask if you'd mind going to the North Pole for her. And you'd tell her you'd be glad to. All afternoon, you try to shrug it off. Tell yourself it's fantastic. That this is the sort of thing that keeps you away from second-rate movies. But that evening, when you call on John Cameron, it's still there. Lucinda Withers, the housekeeper, is waiting outside the door after you finish your examination. Where's Mrs. Cameron, Lucinda? She went out for a moment, sir. Tell me, is it serious? I'm afraid it is. I knew it. I could see it coming on. He's like a son to me, Doctor. I've been with the family for 20 years now, since way before she came. I see. He was never like this before. What do you mean by that? She's not good for him. Worries him. Makes him nervous. Keeps him thinking about the 15 years between them. Uh, I'll have a prescription set over in the morning. I better be going now. My taxi's waiting outside. Just keep him as quiet as you can, and I'll check him again tomorrow. Very well, Doctor. Oh, Dr. Evans, just a minute. I wondered what happened to you. I was just about to go. I left instructions with the maid. How is he? And John Epectorus, it's rather serious, I'm afraid. Oh, he hasn't been taking very good care of himself. He's got to now. I see. Must you go right away? I'm afraid I'd better. My taxi's waiting. Oh, I thought it was waiting. It doesn't seem to be there now. That's odd. I told him to wait. I didn't even pay him. Oh, I, I'd be glad to take you. I can't understand. Oh, I... the car's down at the curb. Oh, no, I couldn't. It'll only take a minute to call. Oh, please, I... please let me. Really no trouble. All right. I'll get my coat. There you are, Doctor. Right to the door. It was awfully nice of you, Mrs. Cameron. Well, I... I guess the next thing to do is get out. Oh... Just a minute. Uh, well, I... I want to tell you I lied about the taxi. I told him to go. Why? Because I wanted to take you home. I'm very flattered. Well, that's all. I just wanted to tell you. It happened to you too, didn't it? Yes. There's a friend of mine, Dr. Andrews. Awfully good heart man. I'm sure he'll take oh, the Oh, please. Case. Please don't do that. What else can I do? It's only going to make it worse if Oh, I... I know, but you... Well, you just can't throw away what's happened to us, can you? It'd be wrong It'd be to... wrong to do anything else, Carol. Is that what we're here for? To spend our lives looking for something that isn't there? Then to suddenly find it? Throw it away? Please, Carol. Well, shall we forget it? I'll... I'll be around tomorrow with the prescription. So that's the way it started, Paul. Yes, it was easy to analyze it, to list a million reasons why it was wrong. But the trouble was that when you were all through analyzing, it was still there, stronger than ever. You visit John Cameron the next day, and the day after that, and before you know it, the days have grown into weeks. And the night you arrange to meet her secretly at that little French cafe on Washington Street leads to a lot more of them. The two of you at the little corner table, Pierre reserves especially, not saying much, just watching the flickering candles all around the room, listening to the music. Well, it's been over a month now, Carol. Yes, Hard to realize it. Are you happy? Happy and miserable. Did you expect anything else? No. I knew it was going to be this way. Oh, it's just that I... I feel so... so helpless. I'm glad you could come tonight, Carol, because I... Because what? Because I think this is going to be the last time. I was afraid you were going to say that. Oh, don't you see how impossible it all is? We're both beating our heads against a stone wall. You're right, Carol. We are helpless. 
The only thing we can do is try and be square with ourselves. It just won't work any other way. I suppose not. He'll probably go on like this for years. He might if he's careful. Oh, it's terrible to feel this way. What way? I, well, I can't help it, Paul. I, I almost wish he'd... Carol. Oh, it's true. I never loved him, Paul. My family thought he'd be good for me. I didn't want any part of it. I know, I know. You don't have to tell me. He's unhappy. He's sick and miserable. It'll always be that way. Why should Please, he... Please, Carol. This is going to be the last time. I mean it. I think I can get Andrews on the case next week. Look at me, Carol. It's going to work out somehow. In the right way. Will you believe that? All right, Paul. If you say so. Yes, Paul. It was the only thing to do. The honorable thing. Approved 100% by the Medical Association. But it doesn't help you sleep that night. And it doesn't help the next day when you make your regular call on John Cameron. Examine him. Find him the same. Leave his prescription bottle with Carol and go. Yes, it had to end, Paul. Because you were both beginning to think the thing that Carol almost said at the restaurant. That you both wished John would die. Then at ten o'clock that night... Hello? Dr. Evans? Yes? You must come at once, doctor. Mr. Cameron's had an attack. I'll be right over, Lucinda. Now listen carefully. There's a bottle of amyl nitrite in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Break up a tablet and a handkerchief and make him inhale it. Is that clear? It's too late for that, doctor. I'm afraid he's dead. With the prologue of tonight's story, Decision... The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But first, a word of thanks to you for a very special honor you have bestowed on The Whistler. In the most recent radio survey, The Whistler received the highest popularity rating in all radio history for a West Coast program. Not just top popularity, mind you, but by far the highest popularity rating in the entire history of West Coast shows. That's an honor never before received by any other program. An honor for which we of the cast and all signal dealers who bring you the Whistler want to thank you. For after all, we realize it's your loyalty to the Whistler that has made this honor possible. And believe me, with such an incentive, you can count on all of us to keep every performance our very best performance. So you'll continue to tune in the signal oil program, the Whistler, each Monday night. And incidentally, next time you're out driving, we also hope you'll stop at one of the friendly service stations displaying signals, familiar yellow and black circle sign. And try that other current signal success, the new signal gasoline. There's no better way to tune in top performance for your car than with that power-packed new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. finally happened, Paul. John Cameron is dead. But it hasn't affected you as you thought it would. There was something so sudden about it. It happened so soon after you and Carol had decided to call it off. After she'd almost said what you'd both been thinking. Yes, there's something wrong with it. It just feels wrong. That's why after you've examined him, you turn to Lucinda. Lucinda? Yes, doctor. You were here when it happened? Yes. Mrs. Cameron had given him his medicine and gone to bed. I heard him call. What happened then? He'd been violently sick. Said his throat was burning. What do you mean? That's right, sir. And he was all doubled up with cramps. Oh, you're wrong. You must be. It's the truth, sir. Did you give him anything? No. It was my night out. And I'd only just come in when all of a sudden... Excuse me a minute. 
Well, Paul... Don't go in there. There's nothing you can do now. I know. Well, it's... It's over. Carol... Oh, don't say anything, Paul. I don't want to talk about it or think about it anymore. Ever. We've got to think about it. I know. You don't have to tell me. Oh, he... He was all right this morning. Just as well as could be expected. All right, Carol. What happens now? I... I won't say any more. You know what's ahead, I guess. Of course. I'll be all right. Oh, it's just You better get to bed. You need some rest. I'll take care of everything. It's almost midnight when you get back to the office and take the prescription bottle out of your pocket, the one you took from Carol's medicine cabinet. You forget to take off your hat and overcoat as you throw a few pieces of laboratory equipment together, dissolve the powder in water, and make a test. A very simple test. Thiocyanin. I knew it. Poison. Well, Paul, it's quite a decision, isn't it? You look down at the blank death certificate on your desk until the letters burn into your brain and you can see them when you close your eyes. It's the most important decision you'll ever have to make, Paul. Is that what we're here for? To spend our lives looking for something that isn't there? Then to suddenly find it and throw it away? Two o'clock. Three, four. All you can do is sit and stare at the desk, trying to think it through. Your medical certificate's on one wall. The Hippocratic Oath in a neat black frame on the other. Six o'clock, seven, eight. Then your nurse arrives. Why, doctor, you've been here all night? Yes, had an important case. Cameron. He's dead. Well... Well, it was only a matter of time. Yes, I guess it was. You were filling out the certificate? You can fill it out for me. Death from natural causes. And Gina Pectoris acute. Just fill out the death certificate. Heart disease? Yes. Do you think they'll investigate? You've got to be careful, awfully careful. Oh, I will. Poison isn't easy to cover up, Carol. They'd find it in a second if they ever got suspicious, so listen. I'll send the certificate over this morning, take it to a mortuary right away, and ask for cremation. If nobody gets curious during the next week, I think we'll be safe. All right, Paul. We mustn't be seen together under any circumstances. I don't want you to even telephone me if you can possibly help it. Okay? Okay. That's all, then. Good luck, darling. Hello, Evans. Oh, hello, Miles. How are you? A little puzzled at the moment. Thought I'd drop in for a minute. Sure, have a chair. Thanks. It's about Cameron. I've had a rather distressing experience. Oh? You know, I've been their family doctor for some time. I didn't know Mrs. Cameron before she married John some years ago. But I've always thought her a rather charming person. She seems to be. You, uh, you know her pretty well, Paul? Well, naturally, in attending her husband, I... Of course. You think she's a woman of character? I'd say so. So would I. Miss Lucinda Withers, however, seems to think she's a murderess. What does that mean? I don't know. The woman was completely confusing, a lot of rambling, disconnected remarks that seemed to imply that uh, you and Mrs. Cameron were in love. That there was a practical reason for her requesting cremation when Cameron had always been against it. Oh, what's wrong with that, supposing she didn't know? I just think, Paul, that you ought to do something about Miss Withers. You know as well as I that this sort of thing can ruin you. Hello. 
Hello, Carol. Listen, darling. You've got to get Withers out of town. Yes, I know it'll make it look worse, but it's the only thing we can do. Where's her family? Idaho. Good. Tell her she needs a rest. Anything. I know it sounds crazy, but it's better than sitting around waiting for the axe to fall. That's it. Good luck, darling. You're walking on thin ice, Paul. You can almost hear it cracking under your feet. And it seems to be getting thinner. The funeral on Thursday, then Friday, Saturday, and Lucinda's still in town. Carol was right. It only made it worse to try and get her to leave. You're just waiting now. It's only a matter of time. And then bright and early Monday morning... Hello, Doctor. I'm Willard Stevens. How do you do? I'm afraid I don't... I'm John Cameron's cousin. Flew out from New York. I see. I have a rather delicate problem on my hands, Doctor. I hope you'll understand. I'll try to. About John's death, I had a letter from him indicating he planned to make certain changes in his will. It arrived just a day or two before he died. Does that suggest anything to you? No, I'm afraid it doesn't. You naturally ascribed his death to his heart condition. Yes, naturally. Well, I realize it would be embarrassing for me to contest your diagnosis. Uh, I'm hoping you'll work with me in... In what? Well, I had a talk with Miss Withers the night I arrived. She's a meddlesome old fool. No? How did you know? Dr. Miles told me. Does that answer your question? It answers that question. I assume you have others, then. Indeed, I have. And I'm afraid, Doctor, there's only one way to answer them. What's that? An exhumation and an autopsy. <laughs> So that's it, Paul. It's all over now but the trial. The next decision is easy, isn't it? It would be useless to try and run away. It would never lead to anything. You and Carol could never find happiness with an axe hanging over your heads. So the next day, during the autopsy, you sit at home quietly in the chair by the phone, waiting for it to ring. Hello? Hello, darling. Is it over? waiting downstairs to take me to the coroner's office. Paul. Paul, would you do me a favor? Anything, Carol. Will you leave now? What do you mean? Oh, look. If it's going to happen, there's no reason for it happening to... to both of us. Well, that's about the most ridiculous thing you ever Paul, said. Paul, please, please listen Go with listen them, Carol. I'll be down there in an hour. It's... Carol, there's only one thing in the world right now. When that's gone, I... I don't want to be here anymore. Oh, I... I hoped you'd say that. Keep your chin up, darling. I'll see you in an hour. Yes? I'm Paul Evans. Oh, this way. All right, Lieutenant. There he is. Just a minute, Miss Withers. Make him admit it. He's in love with her. It's been going on I for... said just a minute. What about it, Dr. Evans? It's written all over his face. All right, all right. I'm in love with Mrs. Cameron. So what? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But first, a question... Why do you suppose it is that almost 5,000 of today's overaged cars are dying, going out of service each day? Are they completely worn out? Definitely not. But certain vital parts are worn out which can't be replaced today. That's why signal dealers take no chance of overlooking even one part when they lubricate your car. Instead, they use Signal's famous lubrication chart, on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point and specifies which of Signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have for long, trouble-free service. And to make doubly sure not a single part is missed, your Signal dealer checks each part against this chart not just once, but twice, which is why it's called Signal Double-Check Lubrication. Well, this is just another example of the more thorough, more conscientious service your car gets from an independently operated Signal station. 
Another reason your signal man is a mighty good man for you to know. Now, when you really want your car to go farther. And now, back to the whistle. <laughs> So you stand there, Paul, shouting to the high heavens that you're in love with Carol, with all of them clustered around you like vultures. It doesn't seem to matter anymore, does it? There's a long silence, and then the police lieutenant slowly walks over to Lucinda Winter. All right, Miss Withers. Now that we're all here, maybe you'll tell us why you tried to frame Mrs. Cameron. Why? I, I don't know what you're talking about. On April 5th, you bought 100 grains of thiocyanin at the black and white pharmacy on O'Farrell Street, right? I did no such thing. You signed Evelyn Jones on the register. That's a lie. Is this the woman, Mr. Thurston? That's the woman. I, I make a practice of remembering the faces of people who buy poison. Oh, excuse me, Lieutenant. I, I'd like to sit down. Oh, sure, Doctor. Take a chair over there. Now, Miss Withers... Why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you put poison in the medicine you knew she had to give him? I didn't. I didn't Don't do it. lie to me. What did you do with the bottle? I didn't do anything with it. I left it in the... Oh. You did have the bottle, huh? Now, why did you try to frame Mrs. Cameron? Why did you try to frame her? She killed him. She killed him just as surely as if... As if she put the poison in the bottle instead of you. That's it, isn't it? She didn't love him. She never did. He was as good as dead. So you thought you'd finish the job and hang it around her neck. I've I, I got to see Mrs. Cameron, Lieutenant. Where is she? In the next room, lying down. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Evans. Now, Miss Withers. We're going to take this all down, right? Carol. Oh, Paul. Darling, I'm a fool. I thought all the time that you'd killed him after what oh, you said. Oh, I know you had every reason. When I think how I acted after it happened, but well, I thought it was you. You gave me his prescription that morning, and... An hour after I gave it to him, he was dead. So Lucinda killed him. She thinks she did. They say they'll have a better case against her if they let her confess at first, before they tell her. Tell her what? Well, when, when you brought the new prescription that morning, the old bottle was still half full. And that's the one she put the poison in. What? That's the way it happened, Paul. You see, I used the new one the night he died. That's why I was so sure you did it. But the prescription was perfectly all right. There was oh, nothing... Of course it was. I was so sure he was poisoned. Those symptoms. Oh, Lucinda was lying, Paul. About the burning in his throat and the cramps. Don't you see? Then the autopsy was okay. There was no murder? They're going to charge her with attempted murder, Paul. You see, your diagnosis was correct. John died of natural causes. Angina pectoris. Acute. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.